it was it was labeled as a workshop i have put some slides together but i thought the best way to do this is why don't i just why don't you guys ask me questions ask me anything yeah we can keep it as a interactive session yeah. because yeah, there's no just... point me telling you what i think you want to know what's worthwhile is you asking me questions that you have some question like uh, um rutul just asked us a question about his patient who here has got patients who are using insulin pump very handful the others who here has got a patient who is rich enough to afford a pump but they haven't uh, recommended it a few more hands so there is a we have this in the uk as well you know where funding is there i would say who who has got patients who meets the guidelines for pump therapy everyone put their hand up how many patients have you recommended pump therapy it's 20% of those people big uh, uh we can invite uh, dr dhruvi and huh? uh, nilata verma also to join i can so um, provided the the what a problem and um, patient is inclined to have a better control of diabetes then there is no question so they are willing to learn everything problem comes when they have lot of issue money see the patient goes for one week big trials and then they get you know lot of back from others how to avoid it i think in my practice i am seeing that or getting informed how to avoid pump because first of all they don't understand why we are using so they start coming and say no no i don't want any attachment on board they to explain them it's not for your decoration for uh, some other purpose until and they serve in them well little difficult mostly patients are in very much in hurry to use the pump you know they one only they want uh, there has to be then 100 per target to train them for many days so if i paraphrase what you're saying the question here is about expectations right and what is the expectation what is the we are using pump therapy and that clarity is often not there we have the same thing you know diabetes actually same around the world right so the clarity of the expectation of, of a pump is i get lots of people saying doctor I've, i've been here i want a pump i meet the guidance i've been blocked from pump therapy because by that doctor said you don't qualify in the uk the main problem is do you qualify for pump therapy and doctors acting as guardians the opposite on patients want the pump and the doctors say no you don't qualify i need to adjust your therapy and so there's a couple of things that i say in that scenario that so what is the qualifying criteria where you say actually without this it's not going to get better and there's a scenario so we so what are the things if your patient is doing three to four finger pricks a day on a basal on a multiple daily injection rate and you're reasonably confident that they are injecting at least three or four times for their quick acting and not missing their basal so i have a i have a general rule of thumb for type 1s and the rule of thumb is if your a1c is more than 10% you are taking your basal five times a week Let me phrase that. If it's above twelve percent, then you're missing your basal at least twice a week, and you're taking an average of one point one to one point five quick acting a day. Whatever the patient tells you, if the A1C is more than twelve percent, they are not taking more than one or one point five. You know, on an average over a month, injections a day. So this is the problem: is see if they're going to inject pre-meal, right? Those people between eight and a half to ten percent, which is the majority of people. they are probably doing about two quick actings they taking the basal every day and they taking two quick actings a day a day in their head because that is oh my chai nashta in the morning doesn't need insulin my samosa i i take it for my meals but i don't take it for any of the other carbs 
And I was speaking to Manoj this morning. He's saying on CGM, I think you find even morning tea and biscuits, you can see, which is not surprising, right? Because tea, even if you've got a sweetener, is a stimulant. We know from data that as soon as you wake up, the increase in cortisol and growth hormones, you know, we talk about dawn phenomena, but actually the waking phenomenon is stronger. Um, and the third thing is two biscuits, particularly Paleje biscuits, that's 40 grams. We'd expect the glucose to rise by 150, by 100 with 40 grams of carbohydrate. It's a, in the UK, 40 grams of carb is a meal, right? Which is two Paleje biscuits. So if you, so, you know, two, that is 40 grams is like four or five units worth for that chai biscuit, right? So it's not, if you think about it, it's not surprising that you're getting that rise, those things. So the first thing is seeing, is the patient covering most of their meals? Once the patient is doing that, and once you've made two or three adjustments, you've seen that doctor, you've seen that doctor, you've made some basal, you know, the, the myth that everyone has is, okay, if I change your lantus, if I change your lantus to Traceba, your A1s will drop by 1%. Bullshit. If I change your, you know, we have this cycle in the UK where they come and see different people. I see me one day and I'll say, I, I can see your fasting's a bit high. Change your lantus from 18 to 20. And they'll go and see the next, they'll come and see my nurse or see the next doctor, see or someone else. Say, ah, you had a hypo last night. I will drop it by two units. A patient goes up and down two units around that same number for six years with an A1C of 9%. It, it, when you see someone who's been in that cycle for more than a year, year and a half, you say, look, you're doing what you're doing. There are two things that are going to get your A1C down. There's only two reasons why you're not at target. You're not covering all your carbs. And you can do that with multiple injections. Or you need to see more, you need to see them. So see them beats form therapy. But at that point, you've got to say, look, if you're serious about getting your control down, then this is what you've got to do. Yeah. Problem, you know, and that's where pump therapy, the selling point here is that without that, it's just, I would certainly recommend though for your, for CGM can be done. The data shows the drop in A1C with CGM, the same, if not more than with pump therapy. Because your first line, you got to say, hey, you know, 5,000 rupees a month. So each sensor is 5,000, right? That's yeah. 10,000 a month. That's probably still cheaper than pump therapy. Still cheaper than pump yeah. therapy, right? Yeah. And you get the same benefit. And if you don't like it, it doesn't work. You can stop it. So in the order of pathway, someone on multiple daily injections, not at control, your next thing should be right. You need to see what's happening. And this is what it's going to cost. Get going. And that's going to, someone comes to your pump therapy, I would actively say, try CGM first. Uh, now I'll, I'll ask you some very practical things. You ask the people that, you know, you have affordable patients and why would you not put them on a pump therapy? So what would be the first bare minimum practical thing that we can tell the healthcare professional who have affording patients? How should they initiate the conversation around using? So the, well, coming back to expectation, the key, what are the key expectations? What do you think a pump will do? So number one, a pump will make it easier and more convenient for you to bolus for all your little meals. I think a lot of the world literature says the benefit of pump is adjustable basils. I'm not convinced. I think the point of a pump is I have my two biscuits, I hit two buttons. I know that patient is not going to inject for, you go somewhere and you have, uh, I don't know, whatever you have here, every place you go. In India, you eat in... Pani, yeah, so, ek pani puri ka yeah. Do gram hai. Yeah. so put it on, right? I had an I went out for the buffet yesterday and I had something. I put in I had some rice, I put in 40 grams, and I wandered on, I saw uh, something else, and I had something more, I hit another button. And and you can dose. It's the precision of dosing and the frequency of dosing that is way more important than the basal rate adjustment. In fact, what we find is people who have a lot of basal rate adjustment, they have worse outcomes than people who have stable basal rates. So the first expectation, look, you want your control, you've got to cover your food. This is an easy way to cover your food without having to stab yourself multiple times. Main benefit. And you get your 1% A1C reduction, which you're going to get, glucose control, that's your expectation, but it's not going to give you a flat line. I always say that your EGM has got to show sign of life. Flat line is a dead person. So, uh, do I add? pump therapy physiological replacement first that is the basic they understand go then it has to go through the pump 
that should be the yeah in the will it bring that conversation when you have a patient uh, who is going to take insulin like type 1 diabetic that person has life long the patient goes through 10 12 15 years and lands up into nephropathy and all then the all 10 years are lost there is nothing can be done so we have to explain them a physiological replacement the artificial that purpose so they get a idea that something required is important and it is available now so that's how i use it turn up the conversation then they come around and learn slow learn or by practicing you know, wrong dosing wrong in wrong so they do lot many things here. so this is all how we have to start and sir physiological so by chance you preempted what was in our mind because my next slide was physiological what the physiology of enzyme therapy so you know when we say physiological you know this is in all the books and you know the companies market it forms of physiological insulin replacement so actually can i'm going to contradict i think that's slightly disappropriate right so this is what physiology is this is three this is medical students put in the lab with every 10 minutes plasma insulin measurement and given 50 grams of carbohydrate three times a day. Okay, this is what this experiment was. And then you look at it and you can see the, um, the couple of things. You can see when you do the split between basal and bolus, it comes out at 50-50. Okay, so if your therapy setup is not 50-50, that is not physiological in any way, shape or form. Second thing is the rise, the peak rise happens within 10 to 15 minutes of the food being given. Right? So Novo Rapid in my clinic is called Novo Sluggish, Humor, Humor Log is called Humor Slug and Fiasp is Novo Slightly Less Sluggish because their peak is at one hour by which time the insulin is already coming down. Okay, So timing of insulin is the most important thing for peak when you look at CGM traces. If the line is going up by more than 45 degrees, that means your insulin is not being given early enough. If you increase the dose because the peak is high, you're going to get late hypoglycemia. If, you're, if that line is going up by more than 45 degrees, you have to pull the timing back. Changing the type of carbohydrate has a minimal impact. Lots of talk about millets and low GI food, zero data on CGM basis about the peak. The peak is governed by the time. Right? Um, second thing about flat versus circadian rhythms, I think a lot of the world who does a lot of pump therapy is moving away from so the, on the left hand side, when the companies come around, they give you these 24 hour profiles with lots of different basal rates. This makes it really difficult to understand what's going on. It's, it's projected as physiological replacement, but what the research shows is that when you're giving insulin in a pump and you make a change in your basal rate, it takes three hours for that basal rate to change in plasma insulin. So having a rate that changes every half hour, I have patients say, oh, when I go for a walk to pick up my child from school, I put a temporary basal on for 10%. I'm trying to think of a polite, I use a very rude word to say that. It, it makes no difference, right? Doing that 10% difference for 15 minutes is not going to change your plasma insulin at all. Hardly any. of the... Then 10% say, come, karo, the, small, so the way we mm -hmm. set it up is, you calculate the total daily dose, halve it, and even if you put another flat basal, it gets more smoother absorption and it's better than an injection for sure for basals. And the value of the pump is that you want to be bolusing more than five times a day. People who bolus on a pump twice a day have the same outcomes as people on injections. They don't change. You need to be past four boluses a day and then you see the benefit. The peak is about six. When people go past, past that to eight, you know, post meal corrections, you, you measure it two hours, put it to the pump. The biggest benefit is pump has a bolus advisor. And having a pump and not using a bolus advisor is you're spending the money and you're not using any of the features. You're buying an AC and using so, it as a pankha. Uh, yeah, so for, for Indian patients, you know, that's okay. We got it from... They have to pick up. Whatever. Means they have a lot of activities, you know. Uh, but in India, the activities are hardly any. Huh. So the one, one top activity they do is only eat. That's... That's why the boluses come, that's why bolusing, frequent bolusing in India, and see counting carbs in India is much harder than counting carbs outside, right? The education is worse, the food is harder to count, which means that, so I would say the world is again moving away from precise carbohydrate counting, right? So a lot of my patients who don't carb count, 
we say a small meal is 30 grams. A medium meal is 50, 60 grams and a big meal is 90 to 100 grams. Chota snack khara 30 grams. What is the snack everywhere is slightly different. But you have a samosa and a kachori, that's 50 grams, right? Straight up. So I will, in my clinic, I'll always go and say, what are you having for breakfast? So talk me through your day. What do you have? What did you have yesterday? And you have, you have a kakra, okay, that's 10 grams, right? So you give them a number that they put into the pump or a bolus advice. And small, medium, large. Even if you're not going to carb count, if you have a small thigh, that's going to be, but if you have a small meal with no roti, that's five. If you eat out somewhere, just put in 50, 80. And then see where you are two hours later. Put in the bolus advisor, it knows how much insulin on board, and correct. But like that golfing show that I showed you, hit the ball, see where it lands, and then push it on if you don't know, rather than not hitting it. Yeah, so multiple um, um, trial and error has to be. So, and to on top of that, first is patient has to accept it. And then they start learning. And this is all goes into their learning, you know. And learning is the most important aspect, whatever data they bring to our clinic. Then again, uh, help them to adjust. And they change their rates on their own, you know. Timings, AM, PM, very, very funny thing, you know. So at first I put pump on 24 hour, they were in 8. So that yeah, is yeah. so small, 8 PM, 8 AM. Night going, the basal is changing so drastically. So some of these things are very, very important in uh, and again, keeping it on. And so again, when you're doing stuff, what, what helps, I think what might help, I don't know, do you think it will help is, is saying what the evidence says when thousands of people use it, what you learn from that. So, you know, that sometimes I find people get reassured. So you say, okay, if you've got a lot of variability in your basal, people who have a lot of fluctuation in the basal rates, they will have worse outcomes. Publish data on that. So again, you want to, you want to, avoid people doing that and say, look, you're going to use a stable basal. And the way I say it is, every day if your, your requirements are different, right? So if you talk about physiological insulin replacement, physiology says that your basal requirements day on day have 200% variation, right? So having one basal dose that works every day, you give 20 units of land to sort of basal rate of one unit per hour or 1.5 units per hour that works every day is illogical. So some closed loops you find that some days the patient needs, there can be at least in a type 1, there'll be about a 15 unit difference day to day, depending on the activity and carb intake. But one thing I want to mention, I forget is India, the biggest growth I think where India can really push forward is actually in type 2 diabetes. You know where the best randomized controlled trial for pump therapy is? It's in type 2 diabetes. The best, most effective trial for pump therapy is in type 2 diabetes. In fact, None of, the, none of the randomized controlled trials of pump therapy in type 1 have showed any benefit. Right? There's all a lot of evidence-based, uh, real-world evidence saying we gave people on pumps and they had a 1% drop in A1C. And we don't know how much of that is because the education they got when they started pumps. But the biggest randomized controlled trial of pump therapy was in, specifically, if those of you don't know it, there's a study called Optimize. And they took people on more than 100 units of insulin a day type 2s, with an A1C more than 8%. And they were randomized. So, firstly, they looked at 600 people, they did an 8-week run-in. And when they adjusted the doses, half the people got better. And those who didn't get better, they said, okay, keep going, we're going to increase your doses. The doses went from 100 to 140 units a day in the MDI group, with no change in A1C, stayed at 9. And the pump group, the insulin dose dropped from 100 units down to 85 and the A1C dropped down below 8%. The best data for pump therapy is if it goes, you know, SEDGs, 120 kilo SEDGs, who are on insulin multiple daily injections, who can afford it, who like it as a status symbol, that's where there is evidence base that they should use. One of my patients was real big. Then I had to give one of my nurse from the clinic for just giving the bolus. She said, I'm not going to do anything. Arrange a nurse. Got a job. Good job. For, Very good to press the button for two time years. Yeah. So, all these, ben these are all added benefits, you know. Is the variability different between type 2 um, versus it? How, how would it, how does that continuous AI benefit type 2? A lot 
I think the main difference is the amount of basal insulin you need because it's going in smoothly. You don't lose so much in the skin. That's where the doses come down and it becomes more effective. Again, on the pump, the biggest benefit that they couldn't count is people bolus more often because it's easier. You have something and you bolus more often. So compared to injections, you get a 30% increase in bolusing. So that drop in A1C matches that. So I don't think there's anything magic about insulin pumps. The more I look at pump therapy, I say pump is just a way of giving insulin. CGM is just a way of measuring glucose. What you get is you get more frequency. So as a driver, someone who has smooth, small, frequent inputs will have a smoother ride than someone who has sh um, jerky movements. Manual and so this is just an, yeah, an example here, you know, if your total load is 30 units, the basal will be 30 divided by 2 gives you 15. If you divide the basal amount by 24 hours, you got a basal rhythm of 0.625. I sometimes give a lower dose between midnight and 4 and a slightly higher dose. So 0.625 I'll give 0.5 between midnight and 4 and 0.7 between 4 and 7 so that the fastings are a little bit better. And then rest of the day, I've now started just keeping it flat at 6 to 5. And actually clinics are doing that, we're getting, okay. you know, so what that does is when the patient comes, we used to spend all our time adjusting. Between 2 o'clock, I'll put your basal up by 0.25 and drop it by 0.25. And it's just, um, it's, it's, it, it's just pissing in the wind. <laughs> so you just, it makes no difference and you just, and it stops you doing the things you should be doing. Hit the basal, keep it very simple, keep it very flat, don't, so these are the settings. Check your total lead dose over the last two weeks and just keep that, keep rechecking that your settings are correct. And then you look, the reason for that variability of getting those high and low blood sugars is because something you're doing, are you count carb, counting your carbs, bolusing in time, or taking the right. Practical. I, I. Not using the lens. Good, really good question. So, so, should the patient make those changes or should? So again, yeah. I'm going to come back to say, how do you make it simple? Yeah. You know, let's say keep it simple, right? And I think I spend a lot of time. I spent the first ten years of learning pump therapy. I was working at King's. We had eight, seven, eight hundred pump patients. Every time they come as a doctor, let me adjust the dose. I'm very clever. I can. Adjust. And I realized you're just going around in circles. I'm just, I made one change one time, patient comes back three months, I reverse the change when the opposite direction. And when you look at this, and there was an index case, I remember seeing her and her A1C was great a while ago. And I thought, and now it was 7% two years ago, now it was 9%. So I said, right, obviously the basals are wrong, the carburation need to be changed, I'll just adjust the settings. And then I thought, hang on, she was 7% two years ago. We go back and see what the settings were then. If I put those settings, we should be back where we started. Settings are exactly the same. What had changed was the behavior had changed of the patient. Right? She was doing four boluses a day then. Now she's doing 2.5 boluses a day. So it kind of made me think. So now when I come back, I, I don't waste my time changing the settings. I look at the total daily dose. So in that sense, that's what I teach my patients. Look, don't. And patients think they've been taught change your settings. They say, I look at my data and yesterday it was this and I changed it and they. They get very frustrated that I'm changing my settings all the time, and it's like chasing your tail, like a thing round and round in circles, chasing your tail. So you put a break to that. Look, your total daily dose will be based on your weight and your activity, and it will remain reasonably constant if you take an average over two weeks. I is uh, algorithm. Self-made. No, no. So, so let's not let's let's be really clear about what we're talking about. We've got pump therapy where someone's on a pump and using finger prick or CGM and making all the decisions themselves, right? In that scenario, you've got a standard basal rate which the doctor has put in. You you govern it, and you're still going to get lots of fluctuation, right? There, the patient still has to do the work. You go into a hybrid closed loop system or a fully closed loop system, whether it's DIY or a conventional system, right? There. There is no basal rate. Patient comes back and says, I'm having hypostoc. Can you change the basal rate? I said, I can't change anything. There's an algorithm written by some software engineer. It's doing the thing, right? I, 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 I can't change it. You've got two jobs to do. You've got to count your carbs and bolus pre-meal and forget everything else. And your control will be better than it's ever been in the past. 
The point you are making is there's some commercial algorithms and there's some DIY algorithms. The major difference is that the DIY algorithms are just, the algorithm itself is more aggressive and the targets that they set are lower, right? So if you look at the biggest uh, commercial system selling in the world is the tandem system. Tandem's target is set at 120. No one in DIY will set a target at 120. Your target will set at 90 or 100. Right? Even Medtronic's the lowest target is in 110, 5.7. So you set your target at 120, you're going to achieve an A1C of 7%. You set your target at 90. So when you look at DIY, premium, a lot of people, so just use the algorithm more aggressively. And because they're generally very clever people who are using those systems, they, they know they can tolerate some hypoglycemia and they don't mind it. Whereas commercial systems, they have to be a bit more aversive to, they are much more um, soft on the correcting a high glucose than the DOIs. That's why the DOIs is slightly better, 10% um, better uh, time. The better... Uh... But we can take some uh, yes, yeah. questions. Just to me now, because I'm not a pediatrician, so I so all, all every all of my patients I have have the algorithm. No, the but it's was, about guidelines. So 780 is a, is available uh, in India, of course. Now, so 780 is a closed loop system, and there again, the role of the physician becomes just to make sure the person gets the kit. And there's a lot of debate. I'll, I'll make a bit of preamble to your question. There's a lot of debate in the UK now because we're going to get a, a nice guidance that will mean that any adult with an A1C over 8% can be eligible for, for closed loop. A lot, of, a lot of discussion, how much education the patient needs. And adult word is important here. The age criteria is there. PEDS, PEDS it's clear, everyone. So PEDS, I think they, their limitation is 7 units per day as the lowest amount. So Metronics, a Metronics algorithm doesn't work below seven units a day. Not about age, but... And but they have an age limit on their license, which is six years. People have used it in lower age groups, so, but the main problem is the total daily dose. The algorithm below that, they don't have the evidence base. Um, there, are some, there are some use cases where out of license people are using it. So again, the fact that a company so like um, Omniport system, they had a, in their study, the lowest age was the lowest kid recruited was four years old. That's why they had to put four years on their license. But the algorithm works down to smaller kids and the biggest benefit is in those really small kids actually. But I, you'd have to ask someone like Tade or some or Thomas Dane, pediatricians about have they heard of use in, in smaller children? But the license is, my understanding is it's seven units a day minimum. Pump now for advice to so patient, we have hybrid closed loop coming through. So I say to patient says, which is the best one? So I say to them, which is the best car? BMW, Mercedes, or Audi? Right. So I'm a BMW man. So I, I wouldn't be seen dead in a Mercedes. Right. And Audi. So, but the ultimate thing is the same, right? So then it becomes a form factor thing. They all outcomes are very similar. All of them get you 75% time in range. My personal opinion is that Tandem, Dexcom, so the Dexcoms and Omnipod has a, the Tandem and Omnipod use the Dexcom sensor, which is slightly better. Metronic sensor, it says it should last seven days. It never lasts seven days. It, they average and it's five days. So Metronic sensors are, are a, their next sensor will be launched later on this year. And hopefully that will correct some of them. They've been saying that for two years. Here is Dr. Danes, Olga Cordona. Both of them have worked on pediatric Pumps below, yeah, and uh, some very interesting. They have you pump in neonates. Yeah. The so pump alone in neonates again, it feels a bulky pump, but actually you can't. You get much better control. And there is this thing, right? In kids, hypoglycemia, bad hypo, bad hypoglycemia in very small kids affects IQ, but high glucose does as well. So, but your question was, I didn't answer your question. Did I answer your question? answer the question. I have again a, a question. So, uh, difference between 670 and 780 that uh, micro or auto correction of big difference. Yeah. Big difference between 670 and 780. 670. But my question Sorry. is that our Indian patients where they want to spend more 
670G possible without tensor? Both the pumps, sir. Both the pumps will work as a standalone pump. Right. But if you're using them no, as standalone... Uh, this huh? is what Metronic are saying, that 780 work without tensor. As they're lying. It then works you will not have the lying. benefit of auto they're lying. They're auto lying. infusion, no? Yeah. The auto, the smart guard won't work. Like if you don't put it's the seat belt, won't then your airbag will not open. Simple <laughs> way. So, but why would you spend for 780 pump if you're not going to use the but sensors? Buy a cheap pump. Price is almost same. Huh? Price is almost same. 25,000. What? what then buy six, the... 670G, like in Jugaad, in our patient, of the patient. Who's CM in... Uh, uh, by other time, they SMB. If the price between 670 and 780 is not different, might as well buy the 780, right? Because when you use a CGM for those no, individual... Almost pieces, 3 lakh rupees different. No, uh, huh. 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 Or to close loop. Close. No, no. 670 is... Okay. 640. And the other one... They So, okay. the yeah. So so if, if so, so so if you're buying if you're paying to get the low glucose spend, you need a pump and the sensor. The person who uses the pump and the sensor, it then becomes it depends on the price difference. To have a six forty with only low glucose spend, if it's only twenty five thousand more, the closed loop gives you a one percent improvement in A one C, right? So I don't see any place for you either use a pump as a standalone pump. So pump alone with finger pricks. You gonna. And then once you're paying for pump and sensor, then you might as well use the 780 and get the closed loop because the difference in quality of life and control is humongous. 670 was very early system and 670 outcomes, 670 kicks you out a lot. So the problem with 670 is a lot of patients come back and it, it makes you do lots of finger pricks. So patients paying for a sensor, having the pump, and every two times a day the pump says, please do a finger prick, otherwise I'll take you out of closed loop. So patients would come back and say, Doc, why did you give me this? I feel like throwing it out of the window all the time. We move them to a 780. My life has changed. Very few alarms, very few alerts, and I'm getting a flat control. I'm getting 75, 80% time in range. So the difference between uh, 670 and 780 is, is, so I don't know, price difference is if it's 30,000 rupees, you say it's not worth getting a 670. Amazing. Patient feedback is, so the patient feedback is always, so it depends where they start, right? You've got a patient who's under 7%, 7%, a super con controlled patient, right? Who's working really hard. You put them on closed loop, they get quite frustrated because they see the post meal highs. They want, I want to do something, but the, because I have spent 20 years of my life keeping a close eye on my glucose and adjusting to everything. And then this pump, you don't know what it's doing. And you're seeing the glucose rising, you know, I wanted to change now. And then they start doing stuff like fake carbing and doing all stuff, which so for those people under 7%, you've got to say the expectation setting is, look, I know you worked really hard to get 7%, but now the point here is I want to give you back that time in your life that the machine do the work, and it will only work if you don't look at the glucose. Right? Just got to let it run. And then... And if, they, if you can't let go of it, you're better off running yourself, right? Use a Libre and a save yourself the money. If you're working and you're not having the... If, if that's not giving you trouble, psychological trouble and burnout, then you're better off using a pump with a sensor and doing your own thing. If you're getting out, I'm working really hard and I'm getting burnt out by doing it, the pump will take that work away. That's the feedback from people under 7%. People We put on people who... I put on people who have never been below 10% for the last 10 years. 12%, 14% A1C. Yeah, we have an, so they come back and say, this is life changing. Right? With 780G, I've got somebody, a few people who are still not bolusing at all. They're using the 780 as a fully closed loop. They just put it on and every three days they change their set. Every seven days they change their sensor and they just go. And we see maybe one bolus here, one bolus there, nothing. Still A1C is 8.1, 7.8%. In terms of their risk of mortality, their risk of complications, game changing. And you do two or three boluses and you're within the low sevens. 
780 is really life changing for those high A1C people. Say, look, you find diabetes difficult, this will take it away. Sorry. A really good question about pregnancy in 780. So it, it depends on your patient again. So what I've seen a lot of people do is we put it on pregnancy and you you once you get past about 25 weeks, because the target is set at 110, right? So you can't get it to pregnancy targets at the top of the pregnancy target. So you can't achieve 70% pregnancy time in range, which is 60 to uh, 140 with 780G. You cannot achieve it. So a lot of the women, but you're not going to achieve it anyway. Then it's better. But if your patient is someone who's on the ball, then what, what a lot of the teams do, what we do is we take them out of closed loop. If you're not achieving 70%, we take you out of closed loop and you use a sensor and pump and go manual. Right? If you're getting to 70%, as long as you're getting to 65, 70% time in pregnancy range, we keep them on closed loop. As they start going out, you push up the carb ratios aggressively, which you have to do. If that still doesn't work, then you take them out and manual them. But it depends on your, you got some patients who came in at 10%. We're never going to get to 70% time in range. With a closed loop, you get them to 55. That's where it'll get you to 55. So you have to make that judgment, person better off or not. Does that make sense? There are people who have some. Uh -huh. He oh, asked. They okay. So pump uses on contact sports. There's a couple of different tricks that people use, right? So a couple of tricks would be you've taken your pump off. So some people will put the pump on a belt, their back or something, and find a way to keep the pump on them, right? Second, uh, so that's one solution that you might use. Second solution is okay. Every pump user should have a backup pen anyway, right? So you you disconnect your pump. You know what your let's say your basal Let's say your total daily dose is 50 units a day. So your background is 25 units. It's about a unit per hour, right? So you can either just connect up the pump, hit a bolus of a unit and take it back off again and your drinks break and your rest break or something, or just do a pen shot, depending on your glucose. So again, you want to have the CGM there. You've got CGM. If you're not, then in your three hour period at one and a half hours, you want to do a finger prick, do a quick bolus. But in that bolus, you can adjust for the basal requirement. So depending on the... And it depends on the sport. So again, once you get into exercise, it gets really complicated. Is your exercise sprinting exercise? Where you're having high intensity sprints with low uh, runs in between where the glucose might go up? Or is it a sport where you're like tennis? Tennis often the sugar goes up because you actually stand around a long time. You have a 30 second, 40 second. Using that much energy, sometimes glucose goes up. You need to have a bolus between each set. When you're doing a long run, you're in a football again. If you're a striker, you stand around and do sprints. If you're a midfielder, you do a lot of running. If you're a cricketer, you're on the boundary line, you're not really doing much activity. So, again, on those DN videos, like, there's a lot of videos yeah. on exercise. So, individualization is very important With according to the, if your patient is um, very much into sports and all, then you have to. Uh, give more time to the patient and uh, fix everything, whatever they want, you know. It cannot be applicable to all the patients. And plus their age, their uh, activity, their EMR, things are there which can be looked into. So uh, you have to see individual case. Have a look on the, DT, on the DTN website. There's a couple of very nice videos and exercise by the people who made the research. So get them to watch that and they show how you can use the exercise to manipulate your sugars and how you manipulate your insulin around the exercise. So there's lots of information. Sorry. You want to choose a good control DIY or 780 or, or your own DIY? So I think, so let me think. So the DIY stories, you know, the outcomes seem to be much better. But it's a bit complicated. Then you start getting issues around um, 
activity around this, that, and the other. And it's about individual choices. Here, I think a DIY comes out cheaper than a commercial system, which is, yes, yes. Which is a big cheaper. factor. Much cheaper. Right? So, no, no contest. You're getting similar results for uh, reduced money, which Indian would not, would pay more to get the same result. You know, that would be American, right? An Indian won't pay more money to get the same result. But in the UK, where things are going, we're seeing a slight reduction in the, because now the commercial systems are catching up. So 670 would get you 65% time and range, lots of kickouts, wasn't that great. 780 is there. Most of my 780 patients are getting 78, 80% time in range, right? So people are saying, you know, I feel more comfortable. I've got its end-to-end uh, -end system. It works well. That's fine. Less Other complicated. People, less complicated, easier to use, plug and play, right? Um, and again, that's the thing with Medtronic, with the 780 system, I think you can start it with the patient having limited knowledge. You need three safety parameters that they need to know on a 780G. And actually with a the pump therapy, you need to teach a patient a lot. In the UK, pump therapy education is about 10 hours per patient. Right? Per, HCL education. Per month? No. Oh. When you start, on, so onboarding. You start. Okay. Onboarding. Okay. You know, 4 5 hours to onboard and then an hour checking, adjusting basal rates for the next two weeks. So on average, we give 10 to 12 hours of educator time to the patient. HCL, you don't need that. You really don't need that. You need to know how to change the pump settings. You need to know ki ane ke pehle bolus karna hai. Or kya, if, you know, if you don't know carb counting, small meal put in 30 grams, medium 50 and big meal 90. That's all you need. And the only other thing you need in closed loop is, what's 15? 15 is, 15, 18s are? 230? 230, 220, 230. If your sugar is more than 250 for two hours, your infusion set is blocked. Change it, otherwise you will have DKA. Simple line. So when we went to this pilot, we had five DKAs in the first two weeks. And that was because these people were used to being above 250 all the time. And they'd been told if you get above 250, you'll have a, it might be an occlusion. But they would bolus their way out of it. But on a closed loop, if you're at 250, the pump has already given you 10 units. So when you try and bolus, it says you got 10 units on board. I'm not going to give you anything. And every single case had the same story. They said, yeah, I had a high, high sugar. I bolused. I kept bolusing doctor. It didn't give me any insulin. And I went into DK. The pump is stupid. No. You didn't listen to what we said. Above 250 on a closed loop for more than two hours doesn't happen. Unless you have a pump occlusion. It's a real important message because one DK with a patient here is going to cost the patient 50,000, 100,000 rupees and they will lose complete interest. This is a really important message for those people using closed loop. That if you go above 250, you've got an occlusion, you need to do a pen shot and change your set. Two things. Uh, one, you said, you know, you are starting above the 12 percent. And on the way, more than 250. Uh, so what, what are the chances of in those category of the patient when you are starting more than 12 percent? Oh. And, uh, they are getting uh, that occlusion or they are, so they, obviously they will be having more. Any So patient was above 12% on injections, right? He was on MDI yeah. and Libre and was at 12% because he was not looking at the Libre and he was not bolusing for his meal. But now why would he be above 12%, right? If he's taking the insulin, he would be at 9%. Yeah. You put him on a closed loop and the A1C drops down to 7%. Right? But anybody on pump will have a pump occlusion. And when that happens, they think, yeah, come back a bit high, it's okay. So you have to re-educate that person that now on a closed loop, this is not okay because it doesn't happen. Yeah. Got the yeah. difference? Got it. Coming to your, you know, you, I, I, we want to know just in detail how that pump education runs over. You said it will be uh, around 10 hours. So deliver on the single day, they are okay. spending 10 hours. How it is treated uh, that we know. Okay, no, really good point. Yeah, good. Really good question. We Thank you. What we can um, do, you have to share meeting with the patient and, um, you know, all these things, take the help of the visuals, make them understand. You can divide 10 hours in three or four. Uh, what's, the current, what's the practice over there? We, so... so yeah, the practice over, over where we work is that generally we do pump starts in groups, right? 
So we'll put four people together in a group. Some people will do one to one as well. It actually it's that's our efficiency because we're putting more people on. So the first four hours, um, will four hours generally the pump rep will be there, and that's teaching them starting story about okay this is a bit of information maybe 20 30 minutes of information this is how it's going to be different and why we're doing it and what the expectation be second piece will be just making sure they're comfortable uh, filling the reservoir changing the cannula inserting a cannula set and we pro and, you know the clinician will have given the basal profiles we get them to program the basal profiles talk them through how you adjust the basal how you adjust the bolus where do you do temporary basals some some of that education in the first day so 4 hours is needed to get that person onto a pump, wearing the pump, insulin started, comfortable that they can change the reservoir, change the infusion set, understand when to think, and then the safety rules. What to do when you're ill, how to treat hypoglycemia, and when to recognize uh, tube blockage. So those are three safety critical things that they have to know before they leave. And then the rest is, that takes, it takes four hours to teach a Gora how to do that. <laughs> right? Who has? And I'm saying that because that person has had a full education program on carb counting and multiple daily dose before he comes to a pump setup. Right? He has had background diabetes education. He's not coming fresh with no knowledge of anything. That person takes four hours. And then, so we always do starts on Monday or Tuesday. Then on Thursday or Friday, they get a call. Have you changed your set on day three? Right? And did that go okay? Is things glucose okay? Any minor changes in basal bolus setup? I get a call again on Monday and then I get a call again on Friday and then I get a call again on Monday. That's very uh, uh, early follow-up. You troubleshoot any issues. By that time, they're up and you, you fine-tune the settings if you need to. Um, uh, so that's, that's what we do. Could you close. share a soft copy of that because a lot of us would be interested in it about the pump, share, uh, the pump initiation visit. Is there Google on here? Is there Google on here? Tech team. Hi. Right. Can you put Google? <laughs> Internet, Chairman. So if you Google, again, the DTN website has got a best practice guide for pump therapy. That's got a full process there, uh, or there's four best practice guides. What to do with pump patients who are admitted to hospital. How to set up pump therapy. How to set up a service for pump therapy. We've done a national guidance for that. So anything I will say was in the, is in that document. Mind me, I'll share with you. I have a hard copy from way back in 2007. You have it? But yeah, I, I don't have the latest ones. It will not change it. We've just written, actually, we've just published the hybrid closed loop best practice guidelines. It is published last week. If you search for, yeah. yeah. But that's the, that's the kind of education program here. Yeah. Something out of this, there are advocates, by looping, talking about the glucagon. Tell us more. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when people talk about uh, closed loop or in artificial pancreas, so yeah. the reason why the world has moved towards calling it a closed loop rather than an uh, artificial, artificial pancreas, pancreas. Is because the pancreas makes uh, a number of other hormones, right? Yeah. Somatostatin, glucagon, and everything else. So, I must admit, I'm in the camp of a single hormone loop because I think with the single hormone loops, we are achieving 80-85% 80, 80, time in range. Right or high 70s, mm -hmm. and the evidence that 75% versus 85% makes any meaningful difference is not there. Right? Once you get close to 70%, if you look at the Swedish outcome data, the difference in A1C between 6.5 and 7 or 6 and 7% in terms of your 10-year risk of micro, uh, micro is, is minimal. Yeah. Right? So you have glucagon. The, the thinking is that you have ins, you have insulin and glucagon, so you can be more aggressive with the insulin, and then when the sugar dips the other side, you put a bit of glucagon and prevent the hypo. Fine. Big dip, there's about a 5 or 6% difference in time and range in people who do a lot of sport. People are very hypo-prone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a single hormone loop is giving you 78% or 80% time and range with 0.5% time below 50. So what's your margin for improvement versus having a bigger pump that has two two chambers, yeah. and if the glucagon gets occluded, and you're given the insulin, you're screwed. If you're given the glucagon, the insulin is occluded. You're stuck. So you've got two infusion sites with a double the risk of occlusion. So in my head, the gain is marginal. 
the complexity and cost increment is huge. It might be worthwhile for people with current severe hypos who do a lot of sport, maybe. Some people, generally behavioral. Generally behavioral. So I've got someone, there are those people, you might have those of practice who want really tight control. We have some people who feel, I feel uncomfortable if my sugar goes above 100. They, they are bolus saying, you know, I've got some people, the auto basal is like 5%. Because anytime the glucose goes above 5.5, they put in 100 grams of carbohydrate as fake carbs. So they are having hypo. So that's all. There are pumps have both glucagon. Not in sensor. commercial marketing today, all in, in development. There are two uh, companies mainly pushing on that development. Um, I think making it work is really difficult. And they will be, I can't see them being less than 80% extra price. They might have to look into make rather than you know double port. So further technological uh, yeah. help. So is they have required, to develop you know? infusion sets that are double. Now the interesting, really interesting thing that's come out is, so in India when people are buying their sets, I'm sure most people run their sets for longer than three days, right? Yeah, seven. Seven days, and the data is very clear that your mean glucose rises by 25 to 30 milligram per deciliter on day four, five, and six. Right. So you look at the data, you look at, and so what happens is people use their sets for uh, seven days. The patient comes to you and you see this, you see some high fastings, especially if the patient in the last three days has been on day four, five, and six. You see high fasting, you push the insulin dose up. The day they change the set, they hypo. And so the way I explain this, right, is that when you incubate insulin at 37 degrees in a plastic tube, it crystallizes. Those minute crystals go down the tubing and accumulate in the tubing and particularly where the tubing turns and goes into the skin. So instead of a lumen being this much, you've got, you've got a deposition inside, a bit like atherosclerotic depositions, and your lumen is half. So instead of getting a basal of one unit per hour, you're getting 0.5 units per hour. So your sugar is going up between meals. Then you get a high reading and you bolus. Now the bolus pushes hard and those four or five units of the correction goes through, so sugar comes down. But then you're not getting the basal, it goes back up again. Right? So you're spending them. So that's the problem. Medtronic has just got their seven day sensor, and I've, I've got two seven day um, infusion set. I've had a, which is, I think, price matched at the moment in the UK. Might be an introductory offer. But um, I've had two or three patients come back saying it's really comfortable, much less occlusions, and they're, they're feeling much better. They're trying to match seven days sensor and seven days infusion set. Um, but yeah, so those people who are running high, keep an eye out for those day four and five highs and saying, so you're spent, it's this balance between you're spending how many lakh rupees on your pump and then you are sabotaging it by, you're, you're having the benefit by reducing your cost by a little bit. Any, any, so, although FIAS tends to be worse, FIAS has got a reputation of being worse. Fiasp is worse. Actually, Nova Rapid. I would say in a pump, Nova Rapid has got the best evidence at the moment. Fiasp has got good evidence in closed loops, right? But I don't think there's any real difference in open loop pump therapy between Fiasp. Is Fiasp more expensive than Nova Rapid here? Similar. So for type 1 diabetes, there is no logic not to use Fiasp. Or actually, Lumjev is the best. Is Lumjev here? Have it here. So FIAS to Nova Rapid to FIAS is a slight increment, but still worth it because people can't pre bolus 15 minutes. So I say Nova Rapid is a 15 minute insulin, FIAS is a 10 minute insulin, and Lumjev is a 2 minute insulin. That's the difference. That's the base. No, we don't, we don't adjust it, it doesn't make any difference. The main difference is the timing. The only difference it makes is the timing, timing kind of difference. If your patient is pre-bolusing at 15 minutes, you'll get the same results as someone on FIAS pre-bolusing at 10 minutes. And it's about the bolus. All the benefits in the bolus, basically, you don't have to change. Oh, basically, you know, there is you keep the basal relatively flat. That is true, yes. So we do get people, so 
there is a small amount of evidence and a large amount of experience saying that some people really struggle with sites. They have a big inflammatory response at two days and uh, some people can cope with four or five days for sure, right? The two days people that we get, we then move, who have a lot of infusion site issues, we move them to shorties, to metal cannulas, and then that resolves the issue. So they have a, they just have the more. Metal cannulas. They're slightly so they're more. Now available. They're available here now? Now. And that a lot of that is the preservatives or the problem with the, with the, yeah, with the plant. All the sets for all the companies are made in the same place. Same company makes them for Medtronic, for Abbott, for this thing. So we can uh, take one or two more questions. Talk we have. Sanita, you have any question? Ask any question. Don't worry. Huh? It's not to be very level or level. Whatever you think about insulin pump theory, and ask about. And it, it can be any question, it's okay, because uh, when we deal with patient, we even don't know what they will ask, and uh, so all questions are made. Go ahead, if you... Hello. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been listening to these uh, wonderful question answers since a long time now, and I'm really delighted to be in this whole world, new world altogether. Mm -hmm. My question pertaining particularly to Indian population is that, you know, as is widely known, basically the complications that we Indians have is mainly because of insulin resistance. So how do we address this by controlling these sugars beautifully? in this particular system with the pumps? Thank you, so this is a, thank you. It's a really good question actually, really good question. And what I've noticed, I moved from London to Leicester, where as you might know, there's a very big Gujarati population. And on average, what we realized, what I, in London, what I'd see, and if you look at all the published data, in type one diabetes, the average insulin dose is about 0.5 to 0.6 units per kilogram. I get a lot of people coming to tell me, oh, I'm insulin resistant, or I'm insulin sensitive. But when you match it back, the 50 kilo person is on 20 to 25 units a day. The 80 kilo person is on 45 to 50 units a day. And the 100 kilo person is on, when you get to 100 though, you start seeing 0 0.7, 0 0.8 units per kilogram. When you see past 100, you see 1 to 1 1.5 units per kilogram. So I think type 1 diabetes is the most beautiful model for insulin resistance because you actually know how much insulin the patient is. Now, what happens is a lot of people confuse the problems of insulin resistance leading to type 2 diabetes with the insulin dose in type 1. I see a lot of people really fixated on reducing the amount of insulin you're having in type 1 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, the only number that matters is the glucose reading. If your person needs is 100 kilo or uh, the point I was making is when I moved to Leicester, I found that the Indian patients, the Gujarati patients, even the kind of you see a, a young woman who might be 60 kilos, they're needing 0 0.7, 0 0.8 units per kilo. So I think in your head, have a look at their weight, have a look at their dose and say fine for your weight it sounds about right so 0 0.5 0 0.8 units per kilogram a 60 kilo person needing 45 50 units is kind of okay just whatever the total daily dose is make sure that 50 percent that is given as basal and you you're using those calculations to judge your your bolus and your correction factor you don't reduce insulin resistance how do you reduce insulin resistance in the same way you get fitter you reduce your weight and again, here, again, I was thinking, the thoughts going through my head here is that the fixation is about sugars and about what you eat. And there's, oh, shakkar ni khayenge, but you'll eat aloo. And the concept that this food is better than that food, a lot of discussion on that. And I find that slightly confusing because ultimately the number that governs your insulin resistance is your weight, right? And so the thing that you should be measuring is your weight. And if your weight is stable, then it, I don't give a monkey what you're eating. If you're losing weight, then whatever you're eating is okay. If you're gaining weight, then whatever you're eating is not okay. So you just need to, what you don't measure, you can't change. And in type 1 diabetes, insulin resistance, you have to get the sugars right. And if you're resistant, give them statins. Because the ins resistance is giving them cardiovascular disease. How do you treat cardiovascular disease? With statins. So that, that's my slightly simplistic thinking. Metformin in type 1 hasn't really shown any benefit. Insulin sensitization in type 1 diabetes hasn't really shown any benefit. Sorry, ma'am. Type 2. 
पंप टॉनिक एंड ऑन डायलाइसिस ठीक है तो आई मीन आई वांट प्रैक्टिकल एस टू हाउ डू यू चेंज द डोसेजेस हैव दैट so a lot of it depends on what fluids they're using in their dialysis now they're doing pd or hemodialysis right so if they're doing pd then you need to put a high temporary basal rate for the night when they've got their pd pd to every day hoga so overnight those people need a high basal rate because they have a high glucose load in their abdomen right they need a high basal rate for hemodialysis patients they'll run high so one of the things on hemodialysis patients is because the insulin doesn't get cleared you need to put the active insulin time long at 5 hours that's going to avoid the stacking of the boluses right second thing you got to do is on the days of hd you might so there's two ways of doing it some people put a profile a and a profile b the on the day of dialysis put a profile a that is about 20% lower in my experience popping profiles people forget to do i have not yet come across a patient where i said i've got a clever idea you do i'll put profile a and b and change your basal rates and you look at the download and they always forget it so i find the use of temporary basals much better because a patient goes to the dialysis i know before dialysis put a 10 hour temporary basal at 60% going to give you less insulin during that dialysis period because the glucose is going away through the dialysis machine and then at the end of dialysis it go you know and put a 10 hour temporary basal at 60% it will go back to normal and that's how you can adjust here i've also noticed that people don't dialyze as frequently as they do anywhere else so in the west dialysis is always three times a week but here i think everybody i've seen on dialysis is once or twice a week maximum maximum twice which is because, yeah there are so many reasons it's cost reason, right yeah, yeah. it's a cost reason but even when people are able to pay because the renal physicians are now in that mindset will do it twice a day how can i ask this person but you know and i don't know if there's any difference i'm not a renal physician but on the day of dialysis just tell them to put a 60 basal rate and the insulin dose will go down that will avoid hypoglycemia during the in the um Yes. this is a good point you know temporary use temporary because profile nobody changes you know pump has profile a b c d blah 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 but nobody knows that which day what you to be done oh, and they yeah, just yeah, do. because you have to you have to remember to turn it on and then you have to remember to turn it off oh for sure you know i would never forget so temporary know. is the best uh, so i think yeah. we are up close it uh do we any remarks yeah dr pratik choudhary should be making some closing remarks before okay. we um i have anything on my slots i was going to say one closing remark is you know the main problem is getting the data so you, i hope you know that on the metronic pumps all the data is on the pumps so uh, you know my patient oh i don't have a download i don't have this i say i don't know on the phone because we do tele consultations right on the phone i say press the history button go for a 7 day or a 14 day summary and on the summary i can see here the basal bolus on the left you can see basal is 57 bolus is 43 and carbs are 83 so i know this person isn't bolusing for all their meals because the carb entry is low who eats 83 grams of carb a day right so that means he is missing the carbs so i've got a point to make second point is average bg is doing bg 4.8 times a day i can see that and then uh, i can see how many boluses they're doing so all this data is on the pump so when you get a pump you find this data and then you have data driven consultation even if you don't have the ability to download software ye wo whatever patient rings you i want a problem okay first thing you do is let me see your data what is your data on there and then i can give you some advice on ah your bolus is you only finger pricking 1.3 times a week you need to you, the pump is not going to work unless you know what the glucose is so i would say that um hey anyway, quick wins so check the frequency of set change mean glucose is always higher on day 4 to 5 of an efficient set right check the boluses per day optimal control that's what the pump is for your the reason you're paying money is so that you can bolus for everything you eat right um check the blood glucose per day cgm is more important than pumps so if the and if the glucose readings if the patient is bolusing more than they're doing finger pricks they're doing blind boluses which again means they're not getting value for the you know tum 10 rupees ka strip nahi laga rahe ho and tum 1500 ka pump laga rahe ho i mean oh whatever it is so what logic is there yeah and then every time you see the person check the daily total glucose and make sure you are checking the basal bolus splits uh, those are my quick tips thank you uh, these are the, ah this is the thing i was telling you all the things are there uh, take a picture of the um url thank, thank you, you so much we had a wonderfully interactive session
Thank you for continuing planning for one and a half hours.